Beyond the Clef is presented by Director's Choice. Welcome to Beyond the Clef, going further with your music program. I'm your host, David Beal, and I'm joined by my guest, Jeff Jones. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me back. Yeah, and uh, so Jeff, this is part two. I can't believe that you're wearing the same shirt uh, as last time I'm wearing the same shirt. We just Did we plan it this way? or It must have been. Our mothers must have called each other <laughs> to let them know. Yeah, and the, the sun is the same position. I, that's just Yes, it's, it's pretty magical. I mean, for me, it was an obvious choice because I only own one shirt. But I figure you probably have a complete wardrobe. Ah, we'll see. Well, today, uh, Jeff and I are going to be talking a little bit about leadership and how to start up a leadership program. Now, Jeff is the director of bands at North Mesquite High School, and Jeff is also the leader of Jones Leadership. So tell us a little bit about Jones Leadership. Yeah, thanks. It started about 17 years ago. I was an assistant director in a different program in Mesquite called Poteet High School. And I remember being there and watching all that transpire. And I, I remember at the end of every year, we would have these ceremonies, which I affectionately dubbed nighting ceremonies, where we'd all go in the room together and we'd be there with all the newly minted student leaders. And we're like, yeah. I dub the queen of the flutes and you, sir, <laughs> king of the trumpets. And you are the captain of the drums. And there was usually some grunting. And then, you know, we'd get real quiet and the clouds would part and angels would sing as they like, I dub the drum major and everything. Oh. <laughs> At least that's how the drum majors felt about it. I can say that speaking from experience. And I remember thinking these are the smartest, highest achieving, nicest kids we've ever had. They love this program more than anybody we've ever dealt with. This is going to be the best year ever. And we'd all leave super excited. We leave, we go home for summer. We come back in August. And after about the first week, we'd just be staring at each other like, you know, and they're staring at me like, and I'm staring at them like, why aren't you doing anything? And what it took me a little while to figure out was they're staring back at me thinking, what was it you wanted me to do? And, it, and it, it was so obvious to me at that point that giving that child a title made them about as much a leader as me giving you two pieces of bread makes you a toaster. And so it just didn't make any sense. And so we just went to work trying to systematically train those kids for the opportunity that they have, try to teach them what it looks like to work in a peer environment and have any level of influence, try to teach them how to be responsible and respectful and, and to use the little bit of influence that they have to work together with their friends in order to create create something really, really special. And so it started with just trying to help my own students mm -hmm. and then grew from there into an opportunity, you know, people across town would say, Hey Jeff, will you come and do that for a little while here? And sure. And it got to be the point where I either needed to get a lot busier at it because I was spending all my time thinking about it or we just needed to stop. And so, you know, anybody can be somebody on the internet. So we started <laughs> publicizing and started working together with some friends and colleagues. And over the last decade, it's kind of grown a lot. I'm really fortunate. I work with about 25 to 30 groups a year. All across yeah, your, the Southwest your the summer States. is uh, packed. I'm really glad that we got you in. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you caught me on a good day, but it, it is a lot of fun. And, and it's just been an honor to help and watch a lot of kids really open their eyes. And it wasn't anything earth shattering. I, I tell the kids it's not brain science and it's not rocket surgery because I'm not smart enough to do either. But it's just looking at things that they already know from a different perspective and working together to realize how they can manage each other's strengths and leverage that as well as kind of managing the weaknesses that they may have by looking into somebody else's strengths. Well, now let's say that I am a uh, high school director sure. and I need to start a leadership program or I need to, most people have something to that effect, maybe not, sure. and maybe it's kind of like you were talking about, there's really, they call them leaders, but they're not doing anything with that. So let's say I need to either start a program or revamp a program. What would you suggest uh, would be a good approach to go down that road? Yeah, one of my favorite Arthur Ashe quotes is there's no better place to start than where you are with what you've got. And I, I agree wholeheartedly on that with this. I mean, for me, it's really just as simple as starting to talk to those kids about what you, you need from them on a daily basis so that they can feel like the other students see them as the role model they want to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important to articulate to those students that if you want people to pay attention to you and to value you, then you need to be valuable and you need to treat them as valuable. I think it's easy to see that title and feel really great about all the work that you feel like you've done to achieve that. And, and you can be proud of that accomplishment. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But you, I think oftentimes we forget that when you win that opportunity, that there are several other great kids in the program who didn't get it, who probably are your friends or at least acquaintances on some level. So how do you work with those kids? But I mean, honestly, in a simple beginning, I just really start talking to my student leaders about the the, the building blocks of the, the work we need, 
You know, I think it kind of grows out of that. Here are some things you can do to make rehearsal run smoother. Here are some things that you can do to take care of some of the behind the scenes stuff that allow the staff more opportunity to do the stuff you're not ready to do. So we started by really trying to give them not only job titles, but job descriptions oh, so that they could start working through, okay, well, I'm the quartermaster, so that means I change the batteries. I'm the drum major, so that means I set up the sound system before every rehearsal. I'm the flute section leader, that means that I make sure the flutes have all of these supplies. I check them at the beginning of rehearsal. And kids are happy to do that, but then where they get into trouble is, oh no, what do I do when that kid doesn't have it? And so then I think you have to be articulate about, you're going to run into kids that don't have it. This is not a, are you my friend? Or I feel bad about this. You, you know, that student chose not to bring said supply. Mm -hmm. And so here's the recourse. We've designed this as the adults. We've designed this. That is the accountability piece. Mm -hmm. And your job is to show them that and to hold them accountable for that or pass them off to us to hold accountable, however you want to set up your system. But I, I think it's giving them job descriptions is mm -hmm. the first start. And That's then right. I think you have to start sharing with them what it is, you know, your vision for what's going on. If you have a vision for things that you're going to try and make better personally over the course of a year, then why not have a vision with them about things that you want to see the section leaders do better than they did the previous year or brass caption heads or even better yet, ask them. You know, you were a section member underneath so-and-so the caption head. What is it that you wish would have worked easier, smoother, been better, that you'd gotten more um, praise for when you were doing it? And as they answer those questions, then go, okay, now you spend 30 seconds writing down for me what it is, you know, how do you want to approach that so that those that you're working with feel like they get a better experience over the next 12 months? Well, now do you start that uh, as a whole week in, in July, in June? And what do you do in your program, for instance? Good question. Uh, honestly, I do a lot of it myself, but we also outsource a decent amount of it. You know, in late March, there's a guy named Scott Lang who's very familiar probably to a lot of folks that are watching this. He'll come in and do a two hour session actually for our district and uh, several surrounding schools that will just come in. It's very reasonably priced when you look at it per student. And he'll come in and just kind of give kids a place to start, a barometer, if you will. And some kids will be like, oh, okay, well, yeah, good. And other kids, it's just like, <laughs> You know, and so giving them an opportunity to just have that thought. And then I follow that up as we move. That's usually right around spring break because that's when it tends to fit with his schedule and our schedule. Mm -hmm. And then as we move through April and we start putting out applications, which I'll get to here in a second, then we start talking to the kids about, you know, you know, that was pretty impactful last night from an emotional standpoint, right? Yes. Okay, well, what did you glean from that from an intellectual organizational standpoint that you can apply to what you do today? What did you glean that you can apply towards a drumline application if you want to be drum captain or guard captain or drum major or whatever. And so the kids start thinking through that. And then as we move through our application process, it's probably the next step where the kids have to apply to, to be on the ballot to run for a band officer position. They have to apply. They have to submit a copy of their report card. They have to answer some questions. And we do all this through Google Forms mm -hmm. so we can harvest all that data and so it can be easy to share with other directors to look at. And, and honestly, at this point, something I stopped doing several years ago is I don't allow them to nominate or be nominated for specific positions. We allow them to get their name in the nominating pool. And then if they complete all the application steps, meaning they do the whole online thing, they turn in their report card by the deadline, mm -hmm. then I'll make sure they're on the officer ballot somewhere. I do allow them to say, you know, my first choice would be to serve as treasurer. My first choice would be to serve as bank president. My first choice would be to do this. These are offices I'm not particularly interested in running for. Here's why I think I'd be good at them. And so then I try to slate the officers to where, you know, I, I don't know about your experiences, but a lot of times we'll have the same five fantastic kids all run for band president. Mm -hmm. And then there's one good kid who would do a fine job running for vice president. But it's like the consolation prize. And so we've tried to get rid of the consolation prize approach, mm -hmm. mostly because honestly, those titles don't really indicate a lot of what they get to do anymore. I mean, think about it. It's the year 2017. We're not letting kids handle a whole lot of money. I mean, they may get to collect two and three dollars here and there, but being the quote treasurer doesn't mean a whole lot. It means that you're on the band leadership team and you get an opportunity to serve other people. Yeah. And so we try to script it out so that those strong kids who would work well get to run in races where, you know, okay, any candidate who wins here is going to do a great job. 
And so, you know, we allow them that opportunity. Once the elections are over, we have an, a, a leadership work day that comes, it's the first day of summer. So I joke with the kids, nothing says welcome summer, like getting to spend an extra 30 minutes longer than a traditional school day, all here in the band hall with me. <laughs> and some of that day, it's this year we broke up into kind of three pieces. Uh, one, because I was interviewing Leonard Slack and I couldn't pass up that opportunity. It was the only time he had. But uh, part of it was we spent several hours just cleaning stuff up and getting things done from the previous year and ready to go into the new year. One was we spent about an hour and a half with a colleague of mine who's really great at marching medium. And since a lot of our guys are responsible for teaching some stuff, we just gave them the tip of the iceberg on that. And then we spent about two and a half hours working through some of the curriculum that I'll work through and through throughout several sessions, just kind of getting their, their you know, eyes open to the idea and their feet wet to what leadership looks like. Leadership isn't a title. Leadership isn't a gift. It's a skill that can be learned. Leadership's not a personality type. We work through those kind of things in a way that allows them to see how they can be effective and be efficient in the group. Then we send them home for summer. Then, you know, some of them come back for, you know, drum camp and guard camp and they're around because the band hall's open on Mondays or whatever. And then the next place we'll actually see them is the Saturday before summer band starts. We'll have a full leadership day and all of those guys will come back. Plus our next level of leadership, which we call squad leaders, which people always chuckle at. I don't know why, but that's what we call them. And so they're, they're smaller group leaders inside the marching ensemble. We have a ton of squad leaders. There are about 440 kids in the marching band. So there's probably 115 squad leaders. They're responsible for a group or two or three kids in oh. their section. And so all of those guys will be back as well as the core leadership team. And we work with them on the ideas behind, you know, more of the marching technique stuff and how to teach that and how to be an effective communicator in that realm, as well as I'll work through some more of the information about how to make people feel valuable and, and how to build relationships that you're going to need that create trust that allows you to have influence. We work through some of that. And then we honestly, we take our student, the core student leadership team. Again, we take those guys to the Dr. Tim workshop that happens here in town. And, you know, those short sessions with those guys, I think are critical because it's a different voice saying very similar things to what I'm saying, but also it's very encouraging and inspirational where they see me as the nuts and bolts guy that they get to deal with 180 plus days a year. They see those guys as mega rock stars that they can, because they are, that they can latch onto and be inspired by and encouraged by. And I think it gives some validity to what we're trying to do in the classroom. I know that's a long answer to a short question, <laughs> but I'm going to go on and say that the biggest thing for me is, you know, bringing in someone to help you and to consult with you and to partner with you to kind of set up a framework for what you want your leadership to be and do is fantastic but it will not solve your leadership problems. You can't expect that seeing Dr. Tim for two and a half hours or me coming and hanging out on your campus for a half day is gonna make life magically better for your program. You're gonna to have to figure out how that fits with your personality and you're gonna to have to constantly infuse that as you go. Well, that's we a good do. segue into my next question is, how do you, or what do you do as check marks throughout the year? And I feel like a lot of time, the students that I see, sometimes they just latch onto leadership equals marching band. <laughs> uh, and, and a lot of our listeners aren't necessarily marching band people, but Absolutely. Uh, how does that work uh, throughout the year, your leadership? Do you have checkpoints to, uh, throughout the spring and the fall? Yes. Great question. And that's still a bit of a struggle. I, I have several clients who are incredibly high achieving, who shall remain nameless that, uh, you know, we agree, and this is a problem in my program too. We agree that it's so much easier in marching band for them to be on that wavelength. Mm -hmm. And then you break into the concert season. And honestly, I think it's because of the group dynamic thing. If you, and I know some of, some of our choral folks and orchestra folks who are smart enough not to make their living by trying to get heat stroke every day from August 1st till October 1st at least are rolling their eyes. But I think there's some implication here too. But when you think about the idea that the large group is together almost every day for at least an hour. And so there's that group dynamic of being there with every kid that does your thing that makes it so much easier for those leader kids to feel connected to the kids that may or may not be in other concert performing ensembles that they're in. And so then we switch to concert season. There's not that daily together dynamic. And so I think it's really important for those kids to continue to be looking for ways to reach out. We do several things. One is we have weekly officer meetings in the fall the transition to more of a monthly thing through the spring. And I, and I'm still terrible about keeping that as consistent as we want, but there is an opportunity to meet at least four or five times in the spring semester and talk through some of what's going on, the band banquet or the spring trip or, you know, things like that. But also at the same time to talk about 
group morale? What are we doing that's fun? What are we doing to help younger performers with regards to grades or growing as players? And so, you know, I'll constantly lean on those kids to continue through their big brother and big sister sibling roles to reach out to those kids that they may not see. You know, I'll often, even at the end of a rehearsal, if I'm thinking about it, I'll say, if you don't know if your big brother or sister, or sorry, your little brother or sister is still enrolled on this campus because you haven't seen them in at least two weeks, today is the day. You send them a text, you go find them at lunch, you come down here after school and search them out. But man, you make a connection there so they know, because I don't think kids, I think the majority of the leadership issues we have are not caused by complacency or by malice. I think they're caused by just lack of information, lack of a recognition that, oh, I mean, yeah, I love that kid. That's my little sister. We had so much fun in March season. And you just get busy applying for college or scholarship or trying to get that prom date or whatever. And you forget that there's somebody there who, you know, when it was easy, you were talking to them all the time. But when it gets a little harder, I, I don't think you're ignoring them on purpose. You just get busy like the rest of us. And so reminding them that, hey, they need to reach out, even if it's just a quick text or a silly meme, you know, you were talking about on the previous episode, I mean, just anything like that to, to rebuild that, hey, we're in this together. And then I think another critical piece for us is as we get close to big ticket things, concert and sight reading is a good example for us in the spring. And on, on a completely different spectrum, but equally as important when it's time for schedule cards to come out for the next school year. Then I talk a lot, you know, because I get the pleasure of being with a lot of the upper kids on a daily basis when I teach the wind ensemble, a lot of our section leaders, band officers, I mean, they're in that group, not all of them, but a lot of them. And so I'll end a lot of those rehearsals by talking about, look, the best thing you can do as we move forward is to share your story with the kids that are younger than you. And the way you create a legacy in this program is by reaching and training younger kids to be the next better version of you. It's very selfish to get to the end of your senior year and go, I don't know how they'll do it without me. It's a great leader who can look and go, you know what? I'm going to miss this. And I'm a little sad to be moving on. It's hard for me to make this transition, but I feel so good about the fact that, you know, when I leave Kevin, he knows what he's going to do and he's got this figured out. And so I'll talk to those kids about making sure that you're reaching out and make sure you remind them, like talk to them about, Hey, you have band on your schedule card for next year. I don't know, man, I'm worn out. And you need to tell those stories about, yeah, March is a terrible time to do schedule cards. Terrible. <laughs> but, you know, we're going to get to May and trust me, you're going to see. I know you're a rookie. The rookie year is the hardest year. You're going to see how awesome this is. Don't give up, man. You've invested too much here. Trust me, you got to come back. You know, and, and those kids have become wonderful recruiters for us. And I consider that leadership, too. We've got to have those kids coming back again and again and again. That's an interesting do, idea. Do some of the stuff we want. The uh, kids doing that part and that part of the leadership role. I've never really thought of it that way, but uh, that is a really good point. And one of the things that I tell some of our seniors and whatnot that I get to work with or really anybody, and this actually applies, I think, to uh, my job, the best part of your legacy is the best year ever in the program that you're talking about is the year that you left because you've left this legacy so much so that someone could build off of it. And yeah. th that's one way to, that I, I try to have our kids think of it. And uh, now, what if I, for instance, am a middle school director? Leadership takes on a different form because you're talking about a whole different level of maturity with the students. So tell me your experiences with leadership in uh, the middle school realm. Absolutely. Before we get to that, because I'm a short, simple-minded guy, can I make one more comment with sure. regards to the, the other stuff? And, and honestly, it has to do with the staff and mm -hmm. the parents. You know, if you're listening to this and you're a head director who has staff that works with you, or even as you mentioned before, you know, maybe you're the assistant who's in charge of the private lesson faculty, or you're the guy who gets to send out the parent communications, or you deal with those volunteers. I think it's critical to continue to build that too. You know, as I get older, and I mean, I'm only 39, but I look 49 or 59, I get that. And, and But as I do, I just start to realize that all of our times in these places are finite. And at some point, it'll be time for me to go. And some point, it'll be time for you to go. And, and the legacy I want to leave is making sure we leave a framework in place where those folks know how to move forward without us. And so I don't know if my staff's looking for it or not, but I'm often trying to show, okay, now look, this is why we do this. Or I understand the decision you made there, and we can work with that. Mm -hmm. Consider this for the next time. Or when parent volunteers are getting to roll off, in your case, to high school, or in my case, you know, to their kid's graduation, we're just asking them, who have you seen who can handle the responsibilities that you have the right way? Or who have you seen that's helped you with this event who can take over and be the lead on that? And what notes can you leave behind for us to try and help them? I, mean, I, I think that's really critical for me. Now, back to your question about middle schoolers. Right. I think it's all the same stuff in just smaller pieces. 
you know, and, and when I work with younger students, I think for me, it's starting to open their eyes to one, what a leader is. You know, I was listening to an interview the other day where there was, it was actually on the NBC nightly news. And there was a, an actress who was praising a young girl who was 10 or 11 who, who stood up for something. And uh, actually I know exactly what it was. Sorry. It was a soccer girl who had cut her hair real short and there was a confusion and blah, blah, blah. It went on and there were these professional soccer players who were applauding her for her short hair and, you know, championing her because she stood up for, well, no, I'm allowed to have a short haircut and still be a girl and blah, blah, blah. And, and I didn't have any problem with what they were championing. I just thought it was really interesting to hear one of the uh, professional soccer players go, you know, that girl's just a natural born leader. No, she's not. I mean, she and her parents made a calculated decision based on some experiences they've had. But I do think it's so common in our culture that people think that, oh, that person is just a gifted performer. Yes, the gifted performers that I know, the Allstate players, those kids, they're gifted with the fact that they can force themselves to get in a practice room every single day, even on the days when they don't want to, even when they think they're the worst player on planet Earth, and they can force themselves to look at their playing from an outside perspective and go, that's good, but this can be better, and they continue to work on it. The same thing for leadership. I, I think a kid needs to know, you can grow into a leader. You don't have to be loud, aggressive, and outgoing. That's not a leader. That's just a kid who's loud, aggressive, and outgoing. So if you're the shy, quiet, reserved kid who doesn't want to be the center of attention, you can lead too. Now, it's going to look dramatically different. But I think helping middle school kids figure that out is a big step, number one. Number two, I mean, before they can really lead a whole lot of stuff, man, they've been doing a great job as a follower. And so much of what they're doing, it's the first time they've done it. It's your first time to be in an ensemble that goes to UIL. It's your first time to prepare a small group ensemble, you know, maybe with a little bit of help from the band staff, but, or the, you know, the ensemble staff, but not as much as you want. And so what do you do to look like a leader there? What do you do when we schedule a rehearsal? I mean, you write it down. If you're going to do an ensemble rehearsal that you're putting together after school, you write it down. You make everybody else write it down. You don't schedule it for tomorrow at 7 a.m. when it's tonight at 11 p.m. and you don't drive your own cars. I mean, you just start talking through them to the stuff that to us seems like, well, duh. Right. But they're in. I think we lose sight because they're so smart and because they want to please so desperately and because they're growing to be, you know, I've met some eighth graders who play fantastic. You know, they're growing to be great little performers, but they're just, they're just 13. They're just 14. And I think it's so easy to lose what they call the curse of knowledge. You know so much about what you do. You know so much about what a great leader looks like in your mind. You know so much about what a great bassoonist looks like in your mind. And they just don't know. And so you've got to take it back to, okay, two plus two equals five. Here's how you work that in the environment that you're living in. And just start talking them through the little baby steps, if you will. A little Bill Murray there for you today. A little baby step, baby <laughs> step, baby steps. As they go through it. And so people ask me all the time, can middle school kids be leaders? Absolutely. My elementary school kids, can, my personal children can be leaders if and when they want to. Yeah. They are not as successful at it every day without constant feedback as my seniors in high school are, or as a young professional like yourself would be. But that doesn't mean that they can't start figuring that out. And I mean, that's my passion is that music is a wonderful vehicle and I love it so much. I, and, you know, you've heard so many guys talk about you didn't do it because you mastered the chromatic scale once, but you made music because of how it made you feel. And I, I, I value that so much, but I will tell you for me, music is a vehicle to teach kids stuff that they need. Music is the way we teach discipline, honor, intensity, integrity, hard work, dedication, communication, teamwork, social skills, problem solving, you know, in short, all the soft skills that they're going to need to use math, science, English, and social studies in the real world to be effective in the 21st century workforce. So I, I think the passion is really there and it doesn't have to be, Oh, well, that's a lot. Where do we start? I, I mean, you start by at the end of band rehearsal, if our kids are struggling with have a pencil on your stand, then you start checking them every day and you have an accountability system when they don't. And I, I mean, I think, well, I'm doing that, but it's not working. Are you communicating to them why it's important to have a pencil? And I think 10 years ago, I would have rolled my eyes like that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard anybody say. I mean, they need a pencil because I said they need a pencil and because they write on paper with pencils. How are they ever going to remember all this information if they don't write it down? And I'm going, you're absolutely right. But I'm telling you, there's kids in that rehearsal that don't know. And if they do know, they've forgotten that's important. And they've forgotten that it's, it, it means that it slows you down. And it means that it gets your focus away from treating them like young adults, like they want to be. It gets your focus away from being able to trust them with how to spin a musical phrase or how to make sure you play be natural when the key shifts in your sight reading piece. You know, you can't trust them with that if they can't show you a level of buy-in that brings a pencil to rehearsal every day. And, and so maybe that's not leadership. 
when you think about Commander in Chief or SEAL Team Six or a Fortune 500 company, but that's where it is in the middle school band hall to start. And then I think it grows out of that as they understand, oh, okay, this is what's important for me to be part of the team. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really, really interesting because that's all stuff that I'm working on right now. <laughs> going into the summer, I, I'm in planning mode. And so I know I'm going to take a lot of this information to heart. And I'm really, really excited. It's always a pleasure to have you on, Jeff. Really appreciated it. And where can people go to find more about Jones Leadership? Oh, thanks, David. It was an honor to be with you. If they're looking for us, they can find us at leadingtomorrowtoday.com or jonesleadership.com. And if they're looking for a little entertainment to keep them moving forward, go to maestrosinminivans.com. Yes. And season three is season just three started. Is, that's right. That's right. Yeah. By yeah. the time folks see this, there'll be at least two episodes I expect that they can watch. Oh, man. It's really, really great. Thank you so much for having you on. And everybody, thanks for listening to Beyond the Clef. Thanks, David. Enjoyed it.